Melanie is going to show us a video of what. Giving it away now. Um, go. So if I just say a few words to begin. So um, at UCL, one of the things that we've been doing is making videos of things which we think are promising practice. And they kind of serve two purposes. One is to engage um, the people involved with the promising practice. So we find that asking them to talk to us on a video is more appealing than just asking them to talk to us. Um, but also, it's a really good communication tool. Um, and so the video that I want to show you is an interview which my colleague Steve Miller did with a woman called Nikki Herbertson, who's chief executive of a company called How To, and they spell it H-A-O-2, which is very confusing. Um, but she um, had an IT company where they employed a number of people who were on the autistic spectrum. And in order for them to interact with colleagues um, in a comfortable manner, they developed some software which would allow them to do that based on avatars. And as a result of uh, developing this tool to enable people on the autistic spectrum to function, um, her business has been built around it. So it turns out to be something which um, has got wide commercial value. So I think somebody this morning asked a question about how actual innovations and industries change. And th this industry hasn't changed as, as a result of us wanting to do RRI, but it certainly has changed as a result of the principles which lie within RRI. So um, I'm happy to answer questions. I won't say any more, because I think that Nikki speaking can do far more justice than I can to, with the video. Welcome to the Responsible Research and Innovation Tools Project. My name is Steve Miller and I'm the coordinator here at University College London and I'm also the director of the UK Hub for Responsible Research and Innovation. With me today is Nikki Herbertson. Nikki is the CEO and founder of a company called How To. So welcome Nikki. Thank you very much indeed for coming in this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about how to, why it was that you set it up and what it is that you were hoping to achieve with this company? Okay, um, how to was set up in 2006, but it's since February 2010 that we've been focusing on the use of 3D online technologies, uh, particularly to support the needs of people with autistic spectrum conditions. The reason for that is that um, that was inspired by some personal reasons, but there's a huge problem with the exclusion of adults with autism from employment. Um, and I observed uh, over a number of days that by using technology, often people with autism didn't seem to experience some of the difficulties that perhaps they found in more traditional face-to-face -face settings or typical work environments. And so I was really just interested in how we could harness those technologies to uh, break down some of these barriers to employment. But I was quite clear from the outset that the only people who really could de deliver the insight that we needed from, from a research and development point of view would be people with autism. Mm. And it was absolutely critical that they were not just a focus group, but actually that they were um, the researchers, citizen researchers alongside me, looking at the options and then designing the solutions in a, in a sustainable way. So one of the key features of what we consider to be responsible research and innovation is engaging with stakeholders. Now clearly you've got two sets of stakeholders, you've got your employees and you've got the people you're designing products for. Mm -hmm. But did you have a formal engagement process? No, absolutely, I mean uh, I think our attitude from the outset was it would not be possible or effective for us to do this without it being a user-led solution. Mm -hmm. So that was, now I guess that's a frame I created, I felt that was absolutely central, that I wouldn't feel confident about any solution if it was just something that was designed in, uh, in isolation based on initial observations. Um, and also these days technology changes so fast and people's needs change so fast that again you need to be constantly uh, reviewing that. So how do you do that reviewing process? Um, 
Number one, I think through effective communication. So it's absolutely critical to um, really listen carefully. And I don't just mean actually listening. I mean uh, facilitating whatever forms of communication are, are necessary, whether that's using instant message chat, surveys, video interviews, face-to-face -face discussions, whatever it takes, emails, having a range of methods of people being able to give uh, feedback, contribute ideas. So it sounds to me like you have to have this engagement process embedded at every single stage. I mean, you said you brought it in right at the beginning, but it's an ongoing uh, uh, activity. You're always refreshing. At a certain point, though, don't you just have to say, come on, we're a business, we're... We've got to make some money. We've got to keep our sales together. So we just have to say, okay, no more engagement. We're going to produce something now and let's hope for the best. Mm. Well, I think that's really interesting because there is always a reason not to do things and cost is always the first reason to resist change. It's very expensive to do it differently from how we do it now. And I think the thing you have to look at is not just the short-term values, but also the long-term value over time. But I think the more interesting point is, it's the knowledge that you can gain. Mm. If you can communicate and understand the needs of your customers or your uh, users or whoever it is you're trying to engage with better, then ultimately you're going to come result, have a better outcome at the end of it. Yes, but if I'm playing the devil's advocate, yeah. I can say, well, you're quite a small company. I mean, 16 employees, it's a bit of a family, very nice, cosy. Can you see this kind of thing scaling up? I mean, how would it work in a big pharmaceutical company or something like that? It's interesting you say that. I mean, there's some uh, developments recently. Um, SAP, um, which of course is a huge company, global company, they've just made a commitment that 1% of their workforce will be um, on the autistic spectrum. I think there's, you know, that's a clear indicator that it's not small, just smaller businesses like myself that are doing this. But I guess it's also a question of watch this space because we are ambitious, we're very light, we're very agile, and I've got some incredible creativity in my team. And the thing that's particularly rewarding for me is that it isn't necessarily just about me growing how to. It's never been about that. It's actually about society being able to benefit from the trainees and staff that come through how to and then go out there and make a difference to a lot of other amazing businesses out there. Nikki Herbertson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.